Howdy, howdy, everybody. My name is Caden from Lab Padre, and this week at Starbase, construction continues on the Gigabay and the Flight 12 vehicles at the build site. Work continues on the Pad 2 launch mount and launch tower hardware, and teams aren't wasting any time demolishing the old Pad 1 launch mount and reconfiguring the supporting infrastructure. Compared with the time needed to build an entire launch pad from scratch, just how quickly do we think SpaceX can complete demolition of the various systems at Pad 1 and move back into the construction phase at the east side of the launch site? To see how it's going, let's dig into this week's update. Starting off with fabrication updates, work on Starship 39, the first Block 3 ship, continued into its next phases, with the common dome being moved into Mega Bay 2 for integration. Transfer tubes were placed on an installation jig inside the Star Factory and are likely for Ship 39 as well. These transfer tubes run propellant down from the header tanks to the ship's main engines for the deorbit and landing burns. The second booster transport stand's Block 2 clamps were removed as workers continue to rebuild the transport hardware to support Block 3 ships and boosters. Workers were welding on the Pad 2 ship quick disconnect arm at the Sanchez site, readying the arm for installation on the launch tower. Moving on to construction updates down at that launch site, Pad 2 continues to come together as crews rush to bring the new launch pad online by early next year. Workers were seen installing paneling to cover the stairs on the launch mount. Vent covers for the methane side of Pad 2's propellant bunker were also installed. Meanwhile, at the Pad 1 side of the launch complex, disassembly work is well underway. The older pump motors and sumps are being hauled out of the complex for safekeeping while the side is dismantled, and joining the liquid oxygen pumps from last week, the four methane pump motors were removed from the tank farm, followed by the pumps themselves, as well as the sumps. The pump farm manifolds were also cut out and removed for scrapping. The liquid oxygen subcooler vent lines, multiple LOX subcooler vent manifolds, and the methane subcooler manifolds were all taken out of the complex. Other support hardware, such as the plumbing assemblies for the pump stations and the pneumatic control valves, were taken out of the site for storage. The continuous flight auger drill rig was moved back to the air separation unit site, along with a small crawler crane ready to resume pile work at the plant site. Rebar cage deliveries began almost immediately, ready to go into the piling holes made by the auger. Demolition work began on the Pad 1 launch mount, with workers cutting out the propellant lines that run around the base of the structure. The rest of the launch structure has been marked in green paint, dividing it into segments that can be cut and lifted out one at a time. And if you ask me, that thing belongs in a museum. Now looking at construction back at the build site, work on the Giga Bay is well underway, with banks of ground level columns being raised and put in place in the center of the site, keeping the crawler crane busy while waiting for tower crane parts. After the easternmost crane's boom and rigging were installed, the crawler was put back to work on the inner columns. With the tower cranes coming online, the easternmost crane was put to use unloading steel from delivery trucks, and the crawler lifted the cab and mast of the southernmost crane into place. Meanwhile, the tower cranes began erecting steel columns on the right side of the bay. The LR-1300 crawler crane was then brought to the front of the Giga Bay site before moving to the left side of the bay, hoisting its cribbing from one side to the other for the move. From here, the crane will finish the assembly of the remaining two tower cranes. Now returning back to the launch site to review this week's testing activities, Pad 2's chopstick arms and their landing rails were tested, with crews checking the arms rotation and the buffering mechanism on top. Once the tests were complete, the landing rails were lowered back into their resting position. The two booster quick disconnect armatures, designed to carry liquid oxygen and liquid methane separately, were put through a battery of extension and retraction tests, continuing the work to verify their readiness for flight operations. Venting was also seen at the perimeter of Pad 2. This could be workers purging the cryo lines, which helps clean out any potential debris left inside them during construction. In other Starship news, SpaceX published an extensive and long-awaited update on their upcoming Starship human landing system, which is scheduled to take astronauts for NASA to the lunar surface on the Artemis III mission for the first time since the end of the Apollo program in 1972. Alongside some new footage and fantastic new renders of the ship's interior and exterior, SpaceX announced that spacecraft subsystems development, apart from orbital refueling, is now complete, and the company is making good time towards spacecraft readiness. A demonstration vehicle is currently in production, and it will perform a demonstration landing with representative flight hardware ahead of Artemis 3 to show that the ship is ready to carry astronauts to and from the lunar surface. 
Several details were made clearer in these new images. The HLS's elevator systems are mounted on what would normally be the heat shield side of Starship, so they will face away from the tower during launch. Navigation lights on the outside of the spacecraft will help astronauts orient themselves relative to the ship while docking. On the inside, the flight deck, crew cabins, and flight controls were showcased. The HLS's engine panel notably shows three sea level and three vacuum engines, as well as six banks of low power thrusters for performing a soft touchdown on the lunar surface. Moving on to our Falcon 9 launches this week, the 135th Falcon launch of 2025 lifted off from Vandenberg Space Force Base for the Starlink Group 11-12 mission, successfully completing as many launches in 10 months as the space shuttle carried out in 30 years. The payload of 28 satellites was successfully lofted into space by Booster 1081, which landed downrange on Of Course I Still Love You. Two more Starlink missions lifted off from Cape Canaveral this week, and we started with the Group 10-21 mission, where Falcon 9 Booster 1077 lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 to propel another 28 satellites into orbit. The booster and fairings were successfully recovered and returned on a shortfall of Gravitas and Bob, respectively. The recovered booster was stowed at the docks and sent back to Roberts Road for refurbishment. Falcon 9 Booster 1083 performed the second Starlink launch this week from the Cape, also lifting off from Slick 40 to propel 29 satellites into orbit and successfully landing downrange. The fairings and booster were both successfully recovered and returned on recovery ships Doug and Just Read the Instructions. In addition to the two Cape launches and the Vandenberg launch on the 25th, two more missions lifted off from Vandenberg this week. The second of the trio launched from Vandenberg was Starlink Group 11-21, which carried 28 more satellites into space on Booster 1082 before landing on SpaceX's sole West Coast landing ship, Of Course I Still Love You. The Group 11-23 mission lifted off on Booster 1063 a few days later, completing the trio of launches with another 28 satellites for the Constellation, and likewise landing on Of Course I Still Love You. In other space news, Japan's first HTV-X resupply spacecraft lifted off from Tanigashima Space Center on the H-3 rocket this week, flying for the first time with four solid rocket boosters to carry the vessel to the International Space Station. Four days after launch, it was captured by the cannon arm and berthed to the station. After an initial aborted attempt, the Starship Pad's flame deflector cap was lifted and installed at Historic Launch Complex 39A, completing major assembly of the flame deflector and leaving the pad nearly ready for the installation of the launch table. A day after the flame bucket ridge cap was put in place, the chopsticks draw works were installed on the tower. Blue Origin announced that they have begun final preparations for the second flight of New Glenn, rolling the rocket out from the horizontal integration facility to their launch pad at Launch Complex 36 for a static fire test. The rocket was raised vertical a day later, with CEO Dave Limp outlining the process of raising the rocket from horizontal to vertical. After another day of checkouts and a few fits and starts at the pad, which supposedly involved an alligator at some point, New Glenn successfully performed an extended static fire test. Dave Limp detailed the test in a post on X saying that they simulated a landing test by shutting down the four non-gimbling engines before running the remaining engines at 50% throttle. The two outboard gimbling engines were then shut down, and the center engine was ramped to 80% throttle, simulating the dynamics inside the vehicle during a landing burn. The next day, New Glenn Flight 2's payload, Escapade, or the Escape and Plasma Acceleration and Dynamics Explorers mission, a pair of Mars-bound satellites from NASA for studying the Red Planet's atmosphere, were mated to their spacecraft adapter and ready for encapsulation in the payload fairing. Honda, yes, the car company, shared a new video of their vertical takeoff, vertical landing development testbed, which serves as part of the company's research into reusable rockets and their greater ambitions for spaceflight. Stoke Space released a short video showing a test of their liquid oxygen side ground support equipment for their upcoming Nova small lift rocket. United Launch Alliance announced the integration of the Viasat 3 Flight 2 satellite with the Atlas V launch vehicle, which is scheduled to launch on November 5th. Vast Space announced that their first space station's primary structure has successfully completed pressure and load acceptance testing and will be moving forward to the next phase of integration and development. And finally, speaking of commercial space stations, Axiom Space showed off fluorescent penetration inspection of their conical docking adapter, providing docking compatibility with International Space Station modules and spacecraft for their upcoming Axiom Station.
And that's a wrap on yet another spaceflight update here at Lab Padre. If you enjoy the content, be sure to stay tuned and press all those fancy schmancy buttons down there. Until next time, this is Caden from Lab Padre, signing off.